Okay, recording has started. Perfect. Okay, so we're good. Um, all right, everyone. So last week, no, oh, it's transcribing my recording as well. Um, I'm going to shut that off so I don't continue to see that because. Okay. Um, if you remember last week, you talked a lot about um, generating the, the rapport in a relationship and how do we do that um, in a sales relationship or any relationship. I think this graphic is really um, perfect to explain. And I will say this, that this graphic is um, pretty important when we kind of think about the foundations for successful relationships, just as this says. Um, and I would say this, um, those that are here today or those that are listening to this, this will be on the final exam, this graphic in terms of what are the foundations of a successful relationship. Um, mutual trust, obviously that's a big one. But if you look at the bottom layer, I think that's, you know, pretty critical. Common goals, right? There's a seller, right? They have a product, they have a service, they have some consulting, they want to sell it. And there's some buyer out there that has a need, maybe it's an unmet need, maybe it's the need behind the need, remember that, um, that we're trying to fulfill. And so then there is this commitment to that goal, right? You have a product, you have a service, they need something, they have a problem, they have an, a, some kind of um, need for your service, your product. And then it becomes, there's then this, you know, organizational support that you have from your organization, even if you are um, by yourself, in terms of you are the entrepreneur and you're the salesperson, your organization, however you set it up, supports you. And obviously the buyer has an organization, even if it's an individual customer and coming into a retail store, they have um, a support system in place, right? Because they need money, they need funds to pay for it. And then what becomes then the top layer is this mutual trust is an open communication. And with the mutual trust and open communication, then we have this back and forth where we're uncovering needs, we're uncovering objections, right? And we're trying to satisfy all those objections, get them handled in a particular way so that it becomes a very fluid experience that they say, yes, I'm going to buy your service. I'm going to use your products and bring in X amount of, of products. And this process, as we talked about, could take five minutes, a minute, or multiple months to multiple years, depending on the kind of uh, product or service that you have. And it will last, hopefully, a long, long time before it's dissolved, right? So let's just talk a few minutes about some of these core pillars, the foundations, right? So we have mutual trust, which, again, if you remember, Mutual trust is a big part of the foundation. So what does that mean, mutual trust? You know, and we can kind of think about that for us, what that means. When you trust a friend to do something for you, you trust a colleague, somebody in your family to do something, right? We have a sense of what that already is. So for the selling process, the dependability is this perception that the salesperson, probably us, and the product, service, or company you represent will live up to the promises that you say, right? And maybe there's not a lot of promises, maybe there's a few, but when they start using it, they find out, yes, the service is reliable for this software. Yes, the product is um, does what it says it is going to do, or the promise that if there's a problem with the product or service or consulting or whatever it is that you're selling, that you are able to address it and handle it. That's part of being dependable, 
right? And then so some of these factors that build the trust, right? We have, you know, obviously your experience as a salesperson, your training, third party, other satisfied customers, other satisfied uh, people that have worked with you, maybe they haven't purchased right away. And then other ways that you can show dependability, we talk about before, you can show them your, your plant, your product and the demo. Um, other types of presentations where you talk about how long you've been in business, right? So we assumed by the buyer that the relationship grows over time. And that's usually what happens when you build trust. Even when there's issues and problems, if you handle them properly, if you get them, and, and, and that is actually, like I said, problems aren't necessarily a problem. It's when they're not handled properly that they become a big problem. But problems in and of themselves build mutual trust. If you are able to handle them, calm the customer down, right? Because sometimes the customer prospect might, um, that buyer might uh, be a little antsy, a little angry that things aren't working out well. But if you're able to address their needs in a particular way to solve what's going on, you've just built the trust. So other factors in trust, if you kind of think about competence, right? We've talked about this. You know what you're talking about. And if you don't know every single thing, you have the ability to find somebody to address that for your customer. So competence, you demonstrate the knowledge that you know the customer, you know your customer, meaning that you can kind of sense if they're having a problem. You, can, you know that you're not gonna bring up irrelevant products that you know that they're not gonna want. You're not gonna just try to sell everything in your book bag, per se, everything that your company offers, if you know that they don't need it, if there's only one product that you sell of the 10 that you have in your, in your company offering, but there's only one that meets their needs, that's all you're going to sell. And that develops trust because they know you could be selling other things. Now, certainly there's upselling. We'll talk about that. Certainly there's ways to get more business and we'll talk about that. But it becomes this relationship that we're building. And then there's competence around your product or your service, right? Got to know exactly, you know, what it does, the benefits, how it could solve their problems. You should know a little bit about your industry, right? Of course, competitors, um, what's happening in the industry, you know, future kinds of potentials. You know, everything is changing technology wise with all the artificial intelligence pieces being built, chat GTP and all the other competitors to those. They're disrupting a lot of places that and a lot of uh, potential roles that people have and making people uncomfortable even in universities. So start to kind of think about some of these other pieces of what builds trust, customer orientation. Again, we talk about this just a moment ago, putting the needs of the customer first. Just because you have nine other products to sell them, maybe they don't need them right now. Maybe there's one or two that you have that in a year's time they will need. And you could just make sure that they know about what you have available without being too pushy, right? There's a difference we talk about a couple of weeks ago, being assertive, right? Assertive in that context is very helpful to allow yourself to show what you have to offer. But again, you're always talking about the benefits of your product, finding solutions to their problems over, you know, your ability to continue to provide service and other things you think about again for us if we're building trust with others honesty right truthfulness sincerity 
There's a lot of salespeople in the world that are not honest. There's a lot of people in the world that are not honest. Maybe not all full dishonesty. Maybe it's kind of little white lies, as they say. Maybe they don't tell the whole truth. They hold back things, you know. And there is times that, you know, if you just had a big blow up with a big customer um, and in the middle of resolving that issue, maybe that's something you don't share with this other customer, right? But maybe it becomes a thing where eventually you do share it. You know, we had this problem with our other customer. They went through this issue. Um, we were able to handle it. And then that builds the credibility that you have, likability. Are you, are you comfortable to be around? Do you, are you always calling them? Are you always arguing with them? Are you friendly? Again, depending on the modality, the personality style, a driver might, again, might not necessarily care about what you're doing. Um, for lunch last night, they probably don't care about that. But an amiable and expressive, you know, if you had a good meal with friends and it was like on the water and, you know, you noticed, you know, something you had seen before, maybe then you share that. Then you develop the likability. But if you go on and on all the time and they're a driver or even a, maybe an analytical, maybe that turns them off. So you have to kind of, you know, likability is adaptability. Think about that. Likability is adaptability because you need to be adaptive in your selling and your communication style, right? And that's what it says, right? That's what we talk about. It's personal communication, okay? And then this part about, you know, on the foundation, I'll go back to this again, open communication, because that's so important, right? This class is about communicating and connecting. Yes, it's sales, selling and sales operations, but it really is, right? Communication and connecting, adaptive communications. So how do we, we talk about open communication, meaning can a buyer talk to me if there's a problem? Do they trust me enough if there's a little thing going on with the service, it's not a big thing, it's a little thing. Can they trust the seller to let them know? Or are they just gonna harbor like, oh, it's not as great as I thought it was. So you have to develop that. That's a key building block, right? For, for long-term relationships. So, and we talk about this, this difference, right? There's the relationship partners and the strategic partners. And a lot of times they're both. Uh, a blend of the two. But if you kind of think about this in terms of the relational piece, the communication between the buyer and the seller, it goes right through the salesperson, you directly, right? Strategic partners between the buyer and the seller. Um, and so as we talked about last time, this kind of reduces, you know, potential conflict going forward because you don't want your buyer, your customer, having to go through nine people in your company if there's a problem. Now, maybe there's a technical support person that this is the difference, right? If, the, if you have the strategic, they go right to the technical support person, okay? But there's always direct communication with the, with the seller because you know, you're the, the first front-facing person that deals with them. But they trust you enough where say, you know, you have problems with the software, call the tech support line. You can call me and I'll dial into the tech support for you, but why don't you call the tech support directly? So that's what we're talking about. So it, it removes layers. You become more efficient in the communication process. Um, common goals, right? Again, we talk about common goals in this model of foundational success for customer relationship. What does that mean? Do you know what the common goals are? That is a really important thing. I mean, certainly we have goals. Certainly they have goals. Who's they, the buyer, the customer, the 
person doing the hiring, the somebody, the boss, they've got goals too, right? But is there a way to blend the two, your goals, their goals? And when you do that, that's the relationship building. That's the foundation. So obviously there's a strong incentive to, you know, to show your strengths and your abilities because this is, again, you want to make sure you've got a product, you've got a service, you have, you're selling yourself, right, to an employer. You're going, you have a strong incentive to promote what you do well and how you do it, your abilities. So you focus on those. And we use this word, you, exploiting opportunities. What that basically means is you are realizing I'm strong here, I'm strong here, maybe I'm not as strong here. And so those two pieces where you're really strong, you're gonna front load, you're gonna share with those are. And yeah, maybe there's a third strength that's not as strong. You'll share that too, but in an, in an orderly manner. So in order to do that, obviously, there's obviously we have to state the goals, right? This is what we're about. This is what you're about. And that is a very strong motivator for continuing the relationship. Common goals. Again, you may have goals. They may have goals. They may be very different. You have to find that connection there. That's a foundation for a relationship. This may take time. Right? This may not be on the first call that you can find common ground, common goals, questioning, probing. We talked about open-ended, closed-end questions. You see when you have a dialogue, an ongoing dialogue with the potential customer, the prospect at the point until they buy, then it becomes this back and forth to find the common goals. And then what happens you get this commitment, commitment to gain mutual, commitment to the mutual gain, that they have a goal, you have a goal, and boom, you work to satisfy both of those. That's the win-win, right? We talked a lot about negotiations. You know, there's win-lose, there's lose-lose, right? You want win-win, right? But it looks different, like their win is different than your win. Sometimes they're the same. But it's not taking advantage of one another, right? That's what it, it's about, mutual, mutual investment, okay? They invest in you and your company, not just with money, but their time, their resources, and you invest in them with your products, your service, your time, your resources. So they spend money, and, and then it becomes this, okay, my company, who I am, I'm going to invest in my products and services, right? And I continue to build those to offer more value, right? And so then, you know, in this commitment to mutual gain about they have a goal, I have a goal, common goals, right? We have to make sure we understand what they are and things change. This is important. What goal they have right now might change in three months. That's like their top goal. So that's where the relationship becomes. You keep asking, you know, is this still the most important thing right now? How are the products and services working for you? Has anything changed? Oh, yes. Well, we have a whole new division starting at the company in three months. We're, we're um, educating them right now and, and getting them ready. Well, maybe this current software doesn't allow for this new division. And as you probe and find that out, you're like, hmm, okay, well, let's work to make sure we have the resources to satisfy that need coming up. That is a new goal, right? And then it becomes part of this organizational support, right? Of all the employees in the organization that you have. Again, if you're one person, the organization is you, but you might have partners that help you, right? Even myself, I have people that help, you know, if I, I have an attorney, I have somebody that does my, my taxes, an accountant, I have some graphic design help, 
you know, sometimes there's software programs, but that in maybe not a particular person, but I can use those tools. That's my creates some structure and, and think about this. So for you and for them, there's always this structure and culture that's important. There's always some training going on and there's rewards, right? Meaning that if you do a good job in your role as a salesperson, as a consultant, as a, a web designer, as an engineer, as a whatever, there's a reward, right? And again, if you're the organization, you see that right away. But if you're part of a larger group, there's rewards. And, and this is like what we, what we work for, right? To make a connection. So then it becomes this long-term process, which is why we're gonna get into the, the next uh, chapters 14. But I want you to really think about this in building relationships. Again, we're not all in sales. We may be in a selling capacity at some point, but we're not all in sales. Think about this as you develop relationships with people who you've not met yet, potential colleagues, you know, people that are new, customers, prospects, leads even, as you generate, remember that funnel that filters down from the lead to the prospect, to the customer, to the satisfied customer at the bottom. This is the foundation for all of that, okay? Any questions? You know, it's, it's, it's really, um, a lot of it, seems pretty common sense, right? What creates the foundation of a successful relationship? Common goals, the trust, the communication. And think about this, when any one of those pillars or steps are missing, then it becomes uneven and the foundation starts to wobble. And then when you have a problem with somebody, think about these five stages where might the issue be coming from? There may be multiple areas, but this is a really good guy to kind of work backwards. Hmm, I have a problem with my current client. I have a problem with a work colleague. What of these five areas are not being met right now? What can I do? And, and as we talk about awareness is huge, right? Self-awareness, awareness of what's happening. Then it becomes like, oh, I see now. Maybe the, maybe the common goals changed a little bit. Maybe I have a commitment to, to reaching that goal, but maybe something changed in their life that they don't have a commitment now. Hmm. We see that with people all the time. Something changes, there's, trans, there's disruption, and then maybe the goal is changed. So they don't have as big a commitment. So we need to dive into that, okay? All right, so let me stop the sharing on that one. As I load up the next presentation, just a quick reminder, we still have assignment number two out. I know a number of you have already looked at that and, and started that and got that in. For those of you that did not, um, I think we have until, I may extend the deadline through the weekend. I think it was only through Friday, but I may push it through the weekend just to give you a little extra time um, to get that done. All right, so get that in. Um, also, so we're on the Tuesday schedule. We're meeting again next Tuesday. Actually, next week we have two classes, Tuesday and then back to Saturday. Um, and what I'm also gonna do, I've been thinking about this, um, I will, you know, I'm starting to gather, get the final exam ready, 100 questions. Um, I will probably give you access to that at the beginning of the last week of class, maybe even sooner than that, maybe 10 days before that last week to give you time to take that exam. Because I was thinking that, you know, a lot of people are traveling, it's a busy time. And so if I just gave you a small window, that's probably not um, as helpful as if I opened up the window a little bit. 
So I'm gathering the, the questions for that. Again, I don't think you'll have an issue if you did all the quizzes from each of the chapters that I posted in Moodle. Um, they'll be very similar to those questions, if not almost exactly uh, the same, maybe with a little tweak of uh, one variable, but they'll be just like that. And so if you've done the chapter quizzes, I think you'll have a very, um, I won't say easy time, but you'll have a, a very smooth time in doing the, the final, okay? So I'm just giving you a heads up on that. All right, so long-term partnerships, long-term relationships. And, and that word partnership, that's, I guess, the ultimate goal. When you have a good relationship, that person, that company becomes a partner. Right, And when you're at partner status, then you have this mutual, I want to help them, they are helping me, kind of. And that's the, the foundation for that great relationship we just talked about. So things to think about in, in this partnership as we look forward, and this is the goal, right? We want to develop a long-term partnership, long-term relationship. So how important we should kind of think about. I mean, some of these are like, duh, kind of questions. Of course, it's very important. Service after the sale, but sometimes there's a sale where it's just a one-off. You know, they come into the store and they purchase, I don't know, a dozen eggs. That's a one-off purchase usually, right? Or, or a quart of milk or a loaf of bread. There's not really much service after that. Now, of course, there was, if the bread was moldy, if the eggs weren't good, if the milk was kind of on its way out, maybe there's a service issue, but usually it's a one-off thing. All right, so it is contextual. Um, salespeople, you know, when you think about how often should we contact the other person? How much is too much? And, and what is a good schedule? What is a good way to do that? I know some people have been using the CRM systems, the customer relationship management systems, or some way to track your progress with a customer, with a prospect, or even a lead, right? And so it tells that, you know, you, how often you've contacted them. You could set up a regular schedule. But some customers, you know, they're doing well, may only need to check in three times a year. Sometimes they want to hear from you once a week. It just depends. And we'll talk about that. Um, which strategies could you use for repeat sales? Right? This is important. And to generate new business with your current accounts. So I have existing customers that have purchased my coaching services. And if they're not, you know, if, if I satisfy them and they signed up for maybe 12 sessions with me over six months and they're done, every once in a while, I'll reach out to them and, and, and talk to them about some other things. You know, sometimes I even give them a free session. I just did that with, with one person. I hadn't seen um, them for a while. I knew there was a big uh, tournament coming up and I reached out and I said, hey, you know, if you'd like a 30 minute free call with me, um, let me know as you gear up for the, you know, and they were blown away by that. My goodness. Right. So there's ways to, we'll talk about that a little bit more. And, um, you know, they're going to have complaints, you know, not everyone, but there are going to be complaints about your product, your service, your consulting, your coaching, whatever. You want to make sure, number one, that you're, you have that open communication to hear them, or there's a way that you can get that information that they are having a problem because it could go on for six months and all of a sudden they leave and they say, well, you didn't handle my problem. I didn't even know about it, right? Open communication. You see why the foundation, those core foundation, those five steps are so important. So we'll talk about the how to handle complaints in this process. All right. So this, this is kind of an important thing when you think stages of a partnership. It's like the stages in a relationship, right? And so think about relationships that we have with others um, and partnerships we have with others, right? So there's this awareness piece, right? We talk about this. Awareness is like in a sales process, generating leads, 
right? And when you have a partnership, you're just becoming aware of what their common, what the goals are, what your goals are, what their objections are, you know, some things, ways to handle that. The awareness piece, right? Asking questions. So we do that through exploration, right? The exploration of this ability to um, expectations, right? Um, how do we follow up? Do we make personal visits? Do we send an email? Do we call? Do we send a, a note in the mail? All these things. You know, the exploration also, you're, you're communicating with them. You'll handle complaints. Things will arise where they'll, you'll call them and say, you just want to check, make sure, you know, it's been a month since you brought in my products. You know, hopefully the, the suits are doing well. And then they'll come back and you know, say, yeah, they, they, they are, but you know what? We had this problem with, with two of the, the suits. Um, the hems on the bottom of the pants started coming up. And yes, we have a tailor that can help that, but I wanted you to know that about that. Oh, okay, sorry about that. Let me make sure I'll check with our manufacturer that supplies that for us. See if they're having additional problems. And so what you can do then is then you are more forward thinking about maybe there's a potential problem that might happen later that you're just generating some information about that. And after all that exploration, there's expansion, right? New products. Well, yeah, I sold the first hundred suits or I sold 50 out of the suits and those blue ones in in 40 regular are selling like crazy, the, the jackets, the suit jackets. So I need a dozen more of those. Wow, that's great, thank you. Um, and you know what? We have you know um, a, a more of a premium line of 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 suit jackets that are that are great for the the colder weather. They're they're a thicker wool. Oh wow, that sounds wonderful. Let's talk about that. So there's this expansion phase, right? And maybe then they bring they bring more of the okay. I love these these thick wool coats. Let's bring a full line of those in and see how they do. Cross selling is all about okay. I have scarves too. Would you like? You know, I know we haven't talked about that yet. You've been bringing in the coats and the suits. We have scarves and hats and ties. Is now the time to sell those? Well, we'll talk about that. When is the time to sell that? So there's lots of different ways. And then there's a commitment you get, right? Certainly, right? They're secure in what they've completed in terms of their purchase or the service. And they know they got good service from you. They can count on you. That trust is there. And then it just becomes managing the change, right? When goals change, when their uh, ideas about what they need change, you're there for them. Right, and that piece, you know, that eventually, you know, there's relationships that last a long, long time. There's others that don't last, but a week or less, okay? Disillusion, um, limited relationships. You know, hopefully, you know, we don't have a lot of those, but there are, you know, people go bankrupt, things happen. Um, people get complacent. You think that, You've done everything that you need to, but you haven't communicated very well on a regular basis, or you didn't find out that you need to do that. You assumed, and then all of a sudden they're like, they went with a competitor and you're like, what just happened? That's reality, okay? So this follow-up, so how do we do follow-up? We'll, we'll talk about that, right? That's important. That's important as a employee, as a colleague, when you're doing a project for your boss, follow up, making sure things go well. So let's let's talk a little bit about that. What does that mean? Um, certainly calling to thank the customer and checking in. This business is so important, right? We talked about in that very first class, um, maybe the second class, the first was more the orientation the emotional intelligence piece to self-assess, this business self-awareness. Where am I coming from? Where's, what's my mood, right? Where's my energy level? And so when you check in with yourself and you know where you're coming from, you need to do the same with your customer. Check in with them, whether the product is working properly. 
How's the service? Right? Staying in touch. Again, these, these are common sense kinds of things, but sometimes common sense is not common practice. We think it's common sense, it, then we don't focus on it anymore. No, it's just going to assume it's taken care of. But again, putting common sense things into making a common practice is really important. Um, I heard that line from uh, Brendan Burchard, who does a lot of uh, sales training, um, does a lot of online marketing. Um, common sense is not always common practice. He probably picked it up from somebody else, but I just I like that line. Um, so what does it mean to stay in touch? Just kind of think about that. You have relatives, you have friends. What does it mean to stay in touch? Connecting with them, identifying if they got some things going on, right? If all of a sudden you start reaching out to customers and there's lots of issues and problems going on, well, maybe that means you're not staying in touch more, you know, regularly enough. Right, so kind of think about that. More about this follow-up, you know, there's lots of ways you can follow up, right? It's just not always, this is important. You can use any and all of these as a combination, okay? Personal visits, right? Sometimes they wanna see you, that's important. They see you, you build a relationship, you know, now that COVID, well, you know, it's kind of in a lull, right? There's still COVID, but it's, you know, much more manageable now. Personal visits are very available and people do want to see you. Maybe you need an appointment, right? But you could at least call them on the phone and, you know, connect with them that way, checking in on them, right? Emails and real mail, regular mail. Sometimes we forget about that, right? Um, thank you notes. When we write thank you notes, personal handwritten, we talked about that and mailed, important. And you could send them, you know, if they're on Instagram or, you know, one of those uh, LinkedIn, you know, you could send them a direct message in LinkedIn or Instagram or whatever it is that you're using that they're using. Maybe you have a an Instagram for your company's product and service. A lot of people do, right? And you know the customers are tuning in occasionally to that, right? And here's the thing too, if you're going to follow up, and this is this is something that I got early on in my sales career, have a reason why you're following up. And obviously, you're not just you know calling to just say hi. You're going to reason, checking in on them, but also give them something. Doesn't have to be physical, but here's is important. Give them something, meaning add value while you are following up. That's important. Because if you don't add value while you're following up, then you're just being a busy, you know, you know, kind of a fly in their ear. Maybe you're too following up too much. I always like that. If you can add some kind of value to them, and that value could be even just checking in to make sure everything is okay. That's a value. Or you know what? Uh, another piece of value is maybe you're sending them samples of other products that you have. Maybe the value is you're talking about um, a customer that had a problem that you were able to solve. Maybe it becomes some way that you are showing your value to them that's important. So just kind of have that in the back of your mind. All right. So they're going to be customer complaints. And again, as you go through this partnership, if it is a true partnership, not everything all the time is going to be working well. And if you can keep the communication open, well, then something is going to arise, a complaint. And you see here, it's critical to maintain goodwill. They're gonna have something, and it may not be a complaint. They might not use that word. It may just be something's not working well with your service in this moment, and it's kind of annoying to them. So you gotta figure out what that is, right? So 
obviously they can be disappointed, right? And so you kind of just need to know that. Sometimes your product or service doesn't perform as well as you thought it did. That happens. Maybe they're using it in not the exact way. Um, this is kind of funny. I mean, I've seen this, although, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure that people have done this and, and gotten very hurt. Um, a number of years ago, I bought a new lawn mower for my uh, lawn, my front lawn. I was cutting the grass. But I saw when I, when I got the, the lawn mower, um, there was a sign on it. Um, do not use on hedges, hedges, you know, like bushes to trim. And I'm thinking, hmm, I guess people pick the mower up and cut with it that way. <laughs> there must be. And they probably had some injuries, lawsuits, people doing that. So obviously they built in safety features, right? If, you, if you've ever mowed a lawn or if you've seen people do it, there's a lever where you have to push. Um, and hold it while you're mowing. And if you let it go, it stops. It's like an automatic stop. It's like the same thing on a, if you've ever taken a small watercraft, a boat out or a, um, a wave runner on the water, you know, if you fall off, you have a line that's hooked into like the key and it pulls it out. So the, the motor stops right away, prevent injury. But sometimes it's not being used properly. That's what I'm saying improper they're using the product wrong and you can't anticipate everything but you can think about you know potential issues and they may have a complaint well you sold them you know get back to this example of coats and but it was not a, a warm coat it was you know a, a two or three season coat it's not for winter they brought it in and they're selling to the customers and people are coming through and all of a sudden there was a cold spell. And people are complaining this coat is not warm or it's not waterproof. And you knew it's not waterproof, you know, but they didn't and they tried or maybe, you know, some of the other products that you have, it's just not doing what they think it should do. So that's a complaint. How do we handle that? And then there's other things, you know, so usually, you know, if, if, you know, personal visits are effective to handle customer complaints. You can do them on the phone. You can do it on a Zoom call, a video call, right? But I've had customers where, you know, like I said, when I was in the flooring business, selling the, the hardwood floor, the, the coatings for the flooring, I would actually go out to the customers that have a problem. So you can explore and see what that's like. And then you know, okay, I can respond that way. Yeah, I have had where they take pictures and send them to me. And then I look at them if I can't get to their place right away. So they'll email me pictures or whatever and try to assess things there. Can't always do it. Um, so other ways to respond to complaints, kind of think about this and what does it involve, right? You gotta get the buyer your customer to tell the story. Maybe they're hiding some things, right? You gotta tell the whole story and you gotta figure out what's happened, the facts, right? You gotta figure out, okay, how did they apply the coating on the floor? Did they let it dry in between the coats? Sometimes again, maybe they don't use it properly. Um, and so then it becomes this, you know, open communication again. I know what's going on. Um, Mohammed, no worries. Um, following through with the action, meaning that, okay, I knew you had a problem. What is it there I need to do to solve your problem, your complaint? Do I follow through? And then if you think about this, the beauty of a complaint, you can say that in a, in a sentence. The beautiful thing about having a complaint is if you are able to solve it and handle it for the customer, that builds value, that strengthens the relationship. If they're satisfied, if it didn't cause them to lose other business, right? Even if it did, if you can solve it in a way that they feel good about it and everybody wins, 
They're satisfied. Builds value, keeps the partnership going. Okay, so sometimes you think about this, product doesn't work. Service in that way doesn't work. You got to ship them a brand new uh, product. Now I've had, you know, I bought, think about this, you bought clothing, even online. So I bought a sweater online. This was a couple of years ago from a company. And all of a sudden I put it in the washer. It's supposed to be washed and dried. Um, it says turn inside out. I did. But all of a sudden, if you know what pilling is, like on a, a shirt or sweater, gets these little uh, balls of material. You know, it, 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 it's not as smooth as it was. And so this sweater started pilling. And I paid, I don't know, it was like $100 for this, $90. It's a lot of money. Thought it was a nice, nice sweater. Um, I called the company. And, you know, they put me through hoops a little bit, you know, oh, you know, tell me about it, what's going on. Um, that's unusual. That usually doesn't happen is what they told me. What happened to me, um, I, you know, how could you handle that? Well, we can send you a new one. Hmm. Is the same thing going to happen? I don't know. But we have this other sweater that's a little more, it's a little thicker but it may not have the same problem. Maybe we could send you that. Like, great, as long as it doesn't cost me anything more. Yeah, no. But they asked me to send them the old sweater back. Okay, make sure, can you get me free shipping to send it back? Oh yes, we'll do that too. Okay, so send them the old one, they ship me the new one, it's, I'm all good. Had a complaint, they satisfied it, beautiful. We've had places that, as you know, you've ordered from something, you have something that doesn't work. They don't satisfy it properly. What happens? Now, if it's not a lot of money, maybe you forget about it. But if it is, or it's meaningful, you spend a lot of time, you know, think about how many times you're calling, you know, maybe your phone company, your internet company, your, I don't know, appliance is not working well. You know, it gets to the breaking point where it's like they can't satisfy you of the service that you had. It disconnects the relationship, right? But if they do solve your problem, hmm, then I know I can come back to them and I'm not, I have less risk to deal with them later on because I know they're going to they're gonna stand by their products. There's companies that give you 100% money back, no questions asked, right? Try this out for 30 days, pay nothing right now. If you like it, then you pay. Free trials. All right, so we can kind of test things out ahead of time. That helps this process. But sometimes they're in the product, you're in the product, it doesn't work. I bought a, a coat from uh, North Face. You probably, you probably heard that. They have a lifetime guarantee on their coats, if you did not know their, their products. So about five years after I bought a winter coat, the zipper broke. Five years. I went back to the store, not where I bought it because I bought it online, but there is a store um, in my city. And I and I told them what was happening. They're like, great, you know, give us the, we'll, we'll get the zipper replaced. They sent it back to the manufacturer where they get that handled. It took a month, three months or so, but they did it for free, brand new zipper. Boom, I'm still using the coat. 10 years later, good products. Um, they get it handled. I will continue to buy their products because of that, okay? What is our role in handling the complaints? Sometimes, you know, we're software, we're not maybe not the technical people, but what is our role? So sometimes it's the buffer, the buffer role, right? We're the liaison between our company and the person that gets that problem handled. So we're the point, we're the facing point to the customer. They'll call us with the problem. We buffer. Yes, it's my company that has this. We'll get it handled. When I was selling in the, the book business, in uh, textbooks, there were times where the textbook that we created wasn't um, 
we created a product, we customized the book. It wasn't exactly what they thought. Maybe there were pages missing. Actually, there were sometimes. The, the manufacturers, the, the people that produced the book that we had, people that built it, they had a problem on their assembly line and some of the pages were missing or some of the pages were printed incorrectly or cut off. Now it's not my, I didn't do that, but somebody, and it's not even my company that did that. It's somebody my company hired that did that. The customer doesn't care. They want the books in the right way, printed correctly. I'm the liaison, I'm the buffer. They complain to me, that's okay. You complain to me, I'll get it handled. We'll figure out a way to get it handled. We were able to get it handled most of the time Every once in a while, there's a customer that you don't get it handled in, in the time manner that they want it, they leave. Sometimes things are outside your control, it happens. But part of it is your job too, is to educate the customer um, that if it happens again, here's the process. Or if this potential ever happens, you know, the hems on the suits of clothing, you know, you had it in one customer, you know, it's a potential problem. You mention it to them, right? If you notice that the hems are starting to come up on some of your suits, your customers are complaining that purchased it, you know, let me know right away, please. You know, we'll address that ahead of time, right? We'll reinforce them. Um, here's the process of how to do that, okay? So, all right, yeah, if you got to leave early, I know, did, no worries, you got it on recording here. Okay, um, aims to achieve customer satisfaction, right? What your, your role again is monitoring. You may not be able to get it handled in that day, in those next 10 minutes, in the next week, but you gotta continually monitor. This is the process, right? When I was in the textbook business, again, sometimes we had to reprint the books, right? Before everything was digital, we had to reprint the books. That would take multiple weeks sometimes. We would try to do it as soon as we can, but we couldn't always. And so, you know, absolutely educate the customer. And so that's what it becomes. You're the liaison, you are the buffer, you have to try to anticipate problems, and you have to educate them in the process of how you're gonna handle this. So the expectations, remember that word, that the expectations and that exploration stage, they understand what to expect when there's an issue. And they know it's gonna take four weeks. They may still not be happy, but at least now they're in the know, they understand it's four weeks. Now, if all of a sudden it's four weeks and you still haven't gotten the books there, then you got an issue. So the buffer, here's the thing, here's kind of a, an interesting uh, comment, the, you add a buffer to your buffer. So you're the salesperson, you're the buffer. If I know that in order to reprint the books, it takes three weeks, I'm gonna say, you know what? It could take up to four weeks. So I build in a little bit of leeway, a little hedging, a little bit of, okay, just in case. And then expectations are such that if it's in three weeks, beautiful, wow, they're, you know, that's great. You said it might be up to four weeks, three weeks, perfect. You know, the issues arise where you say one thing and they've expected that and it's different. And different in not a good way, right? So always kind of think about that as you're educating them. Now you're not gonna, you know, lie. It's not a lying, but you know, it could potentially, there's been times where it does take four weeks to print. Most of the time it's three. So you build in a little bit of flexibility. So, all right, um, this expansion stage. This expansion stage is, is really pretty cool because this is the part where you're adding sales to your account. This is the part where you're adding service, you're adding revenue. This is exciting when you have this partnership expansion. So they're growing, you're growing, Everybody is growing, and so maybe they need more products and services. You want to be able to support them. So here's the things to think about, the additional things that you're going to be providing solutions. And what does this involve? Certainly generating repeat orders, right? Upgrading. 
as we talk about the suits. Example, a thicker wool coat for more winter. Maybe there's a way to upgrade. And then your, your role is to convince the customer that maybe a higher quality product or newer product is better, right? Um, my wife has a car and she's paid all her payments. They keep coming back to her, the, the car manufacturer, the, the dealer, and says, why don't you turn your car in for a new one? We'll give you X amount of dollars. That has these new features. She doesn't want to upgrade. She's fine with what it is, but there's that potential. Some might want to upgrade. You know, full line sailing. You're selling all your products or all your services, right? There's a potential there. You know, somebody comes to me for coaching services or they bought my book. Maybe they're going to be able to come in and, and buy my, you know, as I, I said, I have this deck of activity cards. Maybe they want that. Maybe then they want to hire me for speaking. So I'm always communicating in a particular way regularly. So then I then can cross sell. Cross sell, you know, think about this. You're selling additional products. They're not directly associated with the initial product. Suits, right? That example I use, you know, you're selling suits and coats. Maybe all of a sudden you, oh, I have gloves and scarves and hats. Cross selling. You know, and, and as you do this, you think about this, the greatest customers that you have, the probably the most successful ones that you have had are repeat customers. And it is certainly that last line, less expensive than acquiring a new client. Certainly less expensive. The cost of creating a new client, time, resources. That's why you want to keep your existing business satisfied. That's why you want to keep the communication lines open. That's why you want to have the common goals. And if the goals change, you want to know about that, right? You want to keep making sure that they're satisfied, okay? And so let's talk a little bit about this and then we'll take a break in, in, uh, in five minutes here. Let's just get into this a little bit. Some methods to generate repeat orders and we'll talk about cross-selling and then we'll take a break, okay? So just kind of think about this. Again, think about it also, you're the buyer. What is the seller using to get you to buy more. The psychology, remember we talk about the buying, you know, the selling cycle, the consumer buying, that cycle, how we evaluate things, but it's always great to kind of be on the other side. Well, you know, I'm buying this. What, why am I buying more? Kind of assess that. You know, being present at the buying time, meaning, yeah, you want to be there for them to purchase another set of orders and you're going to help them in servicing the product so if you're if you're with them throughout the whole process of the sales process and checking in on them regularly to get a repeat order it might be you know you're just you're servicing the product well and because you're you know we'll go back to this lawnmower i went each year I take it into the service to be tuned up, right? They're helping me tune in the product of the lawnmower they sold me. And so it becomes this, you know, I was joking with them in terms of the, about the, the use of the hedges. I said, how many people do that? They said, you'd be surprised how many people do different things with it. Um, and, but it's, it, what it becomes is then you are providing those last two pieces the expert guidance and the special assistance. When you provide expert guidance, special assistance to them, you then become that resource for them. This is the long-term relationship. This is the rapport building. This is the trust. When they trust you, they'll come back to you. And then they ask a question, you know what, I have this other issue. I don't know if you can help me with this, but you know, let me see if you do first because you've been really great about things, you know, and, and potentially sometimes, and I've had to do this too, 
even in the textbook business. Professor would call me because they were very satisfied with all the books they're using. They're teaching a new class. OK, they're teaching a new class. And they asked me, do you have a book in? We'll say. I don't know. Um, staffing. OK, and uh, human resource um, compensation. And I and I would say, you know what, I don't have a book there, but you know what? I literally would tell them this if I did have a book. I'd say you go to my competitor, they have a really good book. You know, talk to talk to Joe. You know, they have a really good book in compensation. I don't. Imagine that you're giving business to a competitor. But your customer who will not just buy from you, will buy from other people, is so blown away by that that you just enforced reinforce the relationship. They see, wow, you're so willing to help me. Even when you don't have a product, you'll you'll sh share with me that the the competition does. Wow, imagine, imagine that that relationship building. All right, so a couple of tips here for effective cross selling. Then we'll take a break. Um, what should we do? That wonderful word should. Right again, if we're cross selling, of course we're going to want to know what the other products we have. And we're not just going to want to just throw stuff at the customer and say we have this and that and that. If we know they might not, if then we know they're not going to need it because then it just becomes annoying, right? So we have to identify. Again, you may have suits, and there might be a suit buyer, and you do have, um, let's say, scarves. And they buy those too, but maybe they don't buy the hats. Maybe there's somebody else that's in charge of hats and gloves. Large department stores might have that. And so you got to find out who that is. Okay, no, you need to talk to, you know, Melinda. Melinda handles the gloves and, and hats. And so then it becomes, can you provide me with an introduction to Melinda? Of course, right? So you can sell, and of course it provides incentives, right? Um, in terms of you, you say to them, okay, you know what? So you talk to Melinda. You know what? Since you already bought my suits, and you know the hats and gloves, we're going to be able to give you a ten percent discount because you already brought in the suits and the coats, and she's like terrific. So you you do provide incentives, or you know free shipping, uh, extra dating, whatever it is. You buy ten hats. You get 12, you get two extras for nothing. Or you bring in all the, the, the medium and the large hats will give you the small hats for nothing. Wow, that's a great deal, or the gloves, right? And you just think about, you know, this is the first goal, you know, when implementing a cross strategy is you just want to ask for the opportunity. Basic, right? Common sense is not always common practice. Ask for the opportunity. You know what, customer, we have these products and you're doing your homework ahead of time. You kind of know what might fit in and you ask for it. So obviously you're tracking what you're doing, right? And you're promoting, you're creative, you're creating these selling opportunities because you're in there communicating with them on a regular basis. And then you're getting feedback. Feedback to identify where and how the process is, you know, improving. You know, maybe they don't yet have gloves and hats in their store, but you see that they're expanding their store and they'll have more shelf space next year. So you're gathering that data and you're thinking, okay, when they have more shelf space, so you're putting in, you know, maybe a bug in their ear that, you know, what we have hats and gloves. I know you don't have the space right now, but when 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 that time comes and you and you get that little bit of expansion in your store to have new shelves, you know, we can talk. That's a good salesperson does that. Always looking for opportunity. Okay. All right. So let's take 10 minutes um, and uh, take a 10 minute break here. And we'll, we'll, we'll uh, finish out this uh, chapter um, starting with commitment. Okay. If you have any questions, post them in the chat. Otherwise, I'll see you in 10. OK. All right, welcome back, everyone. And uh, 
All right, let's um, continue here. Um, and talk a little bit about commitment. This uh, particular word is um, multifaceted, as you as you probably understand, and we'll go through a little bit. Um, commitment, you know, what is it? The commitment to continue to use your product and service is a commitment to try you. Is it a commitment to stay with you? Are you the preferred supplier, right? So we can think about this. So this is the stage where the buyer and the seller decide to continue the relationship. And it could be they've already, <coughs> excuse me, work with you for six months as they try it out and see how you do. And then now they're gonna commit to you to go another year and see how it does. Sometimes it's a constant commitment re-upping, meaning that they'll check in every six months. If things are going well, they'll continue to use it. If things are not going well, well, then they'll maybe evaluate and look for other opportunities. But if you become this preferred supplier, the preferred supplier, you may get a larger percentage of their business. So as we kind of look at building this mutual relationship, they're gonna probably buy suits from other manufacturers too. You would love for them to bring all your suits in and the whole store is full of your suits, but you're realistic and to say, well, maybe that's one of the nine different manufacturers of suits they bring in because there's different styles and yours is different than competitor, you know, from a different place and but you're always looking to be the preferred supplier. And, you know, obviously if you're the preferred supplier, the expectations are greater to kind of think about that. There might be more complaints and you know, complaints are more important. Um, but if you're the preferred supplier, your boss, your company might expect because you're the preferred supplier, you gotta get more business out of them incrementally in a big way. And so it puts a little more pressure potentially on you, the salesperson. I know this. Again, I'll use the example when I was selling in the textbook business. There are larger schools available, certainly, right? Uh, brick and mortar schools, not online. Well, they're online too now. Back then, there weren't many online programs. Um, but I would have one large school and the biggest department in the school, maybe in the psychology department or the English department of a large school, and you get the business in the English department or in the psychology department. It's thousands of students. And sometimes they use one book as a core book. Sometimes they use three. So here's the example. In the English department, they might pick a handbook that every single freshman on that campus will use. You get that business, you think there's a little bit of expectation on you. Well, obviously that's a great order for your company and you. The expectation is now you have 5,000 students using your book instead of 500. You think some are not gonna like your book? Of course. You think they might complain to the, the the professor and tell them, you know what, I don't like this book. You might think they might go to the bookstore and the, might, the book might be out or there might be pages missing in the book. Potentially could happen, absolutely. Or as so happens, they bought a used book that the bookstore bought and got from other places, not just your company, uh, a secondary market. And that used book was missing pages, yet because it was your book initially, they blame you. So the expectations are higher. But here's the thing, you're, you're selling in a psychology department, you're one of three books in out of a $3,000, 3,000 copies, 3,000 students, you have, a you have a thousand of them, more potential. You do a really good job. These other professors might see you did a really good job and they're all gonna use you. Wow. So risk reward, right? 
Should you be the preferred supplier? Absolutely. It's just you have to know what comes with that. Okay. So let's look at some examples of the criteria that um, is required to gain this preferred supplier status, right? If you kind of think about, okay, what, what, how do we get that, right? What are we going to have to do to gain that from the supplier? Um, I mean, from the buyer. They might ask you, you know what, we want a discount. We want extra, we, we, we've usually been paying for in 60 days, we want 90 days. You know, if you're gonna be the preferred supplier, you're gonna have to give up a little bit of uh, flexibility on these kinds of things on maybe your price point. You've been selling these suits for $60 to us, if you become the preferred supplier and we bring more in, we want them for $55. So you got to think about that. And so then the, also you think about this improved process, right? They might want, well, you know, it's been taking three weeks when we order suits from you to ship. We got to figure out, we got to get them here quicker. If you're the preferred supplier, two week lead time. You know, we can't be without product on the shelves. We're, we're losing sales. So you got to be able to ship it quicker. They might ask for that. Um, inventory management, where they might say, you know what? Can you, you know, we only have enough, so much shelf space. Can you help us with managing that inventory? Can you track it a little bit more? So when you when we know that we brought in 100 of these suits, 10 in these different styles, when it gets down to four, you already know it. So you're managing that. You're sending another six for us, right? We don't have to call you. You you automatically know that. You know maybe there's some software that does that. Also, you think they might want quality, more quality and innovation, right? Okay, if you're the preferred supplier, you're gonna have to supply some new um, new designs of your suits. You know, every year, you know, clothing, there's always new styles, you know, so we want the latest style of suits. You gotta make sure we get that. If you're the preferred supplier, we want it before all the other people. We want to be the first one to have that new style of suit. Maybe it's got different colors or the buttons are different colors on the suit or something. Who knows? Right? The pocket looks different. We want that. You know, so they might say you have a new color that you brought out, you know, platinum. We want to be the first one to have that in our store. Preferred supplier status. And, you know, they may want specific packaging. They might want it, okay, sustainable. You know, you're shipping all these suits with these peanuts, right? You've seen those before, shipping products, all the extra stuff they put in there. Well, you know what? You know, that's that's costing us, you know, we got to pay for trash removal and stuff. We want to be able to have less waste. How could you ship those products to us and provide better packaging so that we don't have all those things? Maybe we deliver them differently, and so we take the packaging with us. When I order um, appliances, you know, and I see the appliance people, they come down the street and they take the appliance off the truck, they pull it out of the box, and they bring the appliance in the house. And if they hook it up, you know, I pay for them to hook it up or not, um, they take the box away. You know, sometimes, what am I going to do with a box, right? So it becomes like preferred status. You know, some of these companies, they want a preferred status of a customer. You know, if I want to order from them, I don't want to have all the packaging. So there's lots of criteria to think about. If you become a preferred supplier, think about this. If you are the preferred, I'm going to change the language here. If you are the preferred employee at your company, meaning preferred, your boss out of 10 employees, 
They come to you when there's a big issue. They come to you when there's a problem. They come to you. Do you want to be that? You're the preferred employee, the favorite employee. You get things done. They come to you when there's a difficult uh, customer to deal with. And so that is a great thing to be recognized, to be known as. Remember, we talked about what do I want to be known as? I want to be known as the go-to person in my company. There's a responsibility with that. But here's the thing. In order to be that, what do you have to give up sometimes, right? Time for you it may cost more of your time if you're that preferred employee, the go-to person. You may have to stay a little bit longer. Not only that, you may have to do more work with other people. So it causes you to have to check in with other companies, uh, employees, other divisions perhaps. You may have to you know, do jobs that are not directly in your you know job description so think about what are you giving up but there's always this call it preferred status right you could be preferred at an airline preferred customer what does that mean what do you get well if you're preferred on an airline you have to fly a certain amount of miles right they don't do this as much as they used to now it's because it's so competitive right but they're still for those top flyers, you know, they get preferred status, get to sit up front, get, you know, first class or business class, extra leg room. What is that? I still have to fly a lot. Forget that preferred status. So pay more money, bigger tickets. So just kind of start thinking about that. Other things to consider here too. So examples of the criteria we talk about, some of these other things to think about um, to gain status. In, in commercial, you know, um, small businesses, woman-owned, minority-owned vendors, um, that might give you an edge to gain the preferred status. Maybe they wanna deal with more women. You know, I there's a couple of, of women that I know that are that are pretty well off in terms of when in a company like CEOs in, in various places and they have this role, you know, there's not very many women um, executives in artificial intelligence or in science in certain places. And so some people want to deal with that and gain that by being a little different. Right. So again, it's how you promote yourself, what you're looking at. There's global initiatives, right? Access to new markets, right? So you can gain preferred supplier status, perhaps if you're able to, to deliver your products internationally, you know, or on a larger region. So it comes down to maybe you can improve the process better than anybody else. You know, there's all these environmentally friendly uh, construction companies and building companies, right? And there's certain certifications that you go through, um, lead certification, they call it, and different ways that you're environmentally sound. And so do you have a better process than somebody else to get that done? Maybe that allows you to become the preferred supplier because you do. Maybe your quality is the best in the industry. And so they want your suits because they know, yeah, they're more expensive, but they'll never have a problem with them. People will love them. Maybe you're very innovative. Maybe you have new designs and things. And so they want that. You know, so there's all these possibilities to become a preferred supplier. But again, to bring it home, Think about as you're in your role in your job with your boss, your company. If you don't work for yourself, think about this. How could you gain that preferred status or do you want to? Maybe there's a preferred status in a particular area that you want, right? That you're working towards. You want to be a manager. You know, so just kind of start to think through some of these things. And as we secure, Commitments, do a partnership, just kind of think about this. We can 
become getting this in, ensuring a commitment from the entire organization. So it becomes not just the buyer or even not just your boss, but the entire organization can give you a commitment for the partnership. That's important. So, you know, do, does your boss have you, your back? Does your company have your back? Meaning that do they support you, the whole organization? Then you can partner with people in your company to partner with people that you're selling your products and services to. That's what it comes down to. Then it becomes this culture. Is it is this a good fit, right? With the buyer's culture. So you get a commitment when the cultures mesh. Now you might be different than the rest of your company in terms of maybe you are very expressive. The rest of your company is full of drivers. That's okay if you're the lead facing person. But again, it comes to common goals, right? Culture is important. Maybe it's, sometimes it's not as important, but the open you know, piece we talked about, open channels of communication. That is like, that, I should put that in red, my goodness. That's, that's key commitment in relationships and, and partnerships in long-term. Open lines of communication, right? It's part of that foundation those five foundational pieces and, you know, trust. Can they depend on you? Do they think you're competent, right? We talk about this at the beginning, right? Are you honest? Can they trust you? And then you become important. You become important because you then have these qualities that they can rely on and trust you. So then this commitment, you know, we could kind of think about what does it look like in terms of the communication and the culture? You know, we'll go in a little bit deeper here. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but it's it's kind of important. Um, and again, think about this in your own business, in your own company, in, in people that you hang out with. You know, there's a culture that you have within your friends too, communication. So what does it look like? Salespeople should actively seek opportunities to communicate with the customer at times other than when you're selling them or other than when you're re resolving problems. You don't only want to talk to them when you have something to sell. You don't only want to talk to them about when there's a problem. Sometimes, again, it's just checking in. Hey, how's it going? Sometimes it's checking in. Maybe you have a company race you're sponsoring in the community. This happens, right? A community event and you would love not necessarily to have them as a sponsor, but you would love their employees to take advantage of it. So you call about that. That's a communication. That's something totally different. Maybe you're, you're like, you know what? You've been doing a great job. I'd like to bring lunch in for your warehouse people because they've been shipping the product so well, you know, with your company, with their company, whatever, you bring lunch in. That's all you're doing. I'm gonna order pizzas, you know, you can order pizzas or, or whatever, and I'll pay for them. It, that could be it, right? So you're you're constantly communicating, but think about this, and this is you know a role as a parent. If a parent, if a kid always comes to the parent and says, "I need money," you know, for this or that, you know, it's like that's the only time they come to you is when there's a problem. But if they come to you when there's other stuff going on, you're more willing to maybe part with that extra $20 because they want a video game or something, right? Just throwing that out um, there. Um, so let's look at this corporate culture. We kind of think about this, like you, your company has a culture, the potential prospect, the customer, the buyer, they have a culture. So, you know, and how does that get set up, right? It's the values and beliefs held by the senior management, usually. What are they espousing? There's lots of companies in the world. There's lots of companies with bad culture, bad corporate culture, mistrust. They, it's like the opposite of building the long term. There's not a lot of honesty. There's not a lot of trust. There's not open communication. All right? Your role is to kind of think about how this shapes, you know, obviously you can get into a company. We've always had this probably many of us have 
experienced this or know somebody that's been, we get into a job and we're like, this culture stinks. They don't support me. They don't support what's going on. They don't support the customer. I gotta leave, right? So the the shape of the attitudes and the actions of employees, that's what it's, it's the co company culture shapes that, right? So if you're selling to this buyer and they got a terrible culture at their company, you gotta be aware of that. Right? Maybe you love the buyer, they keep bringing in your products, but their overall company culture, maybe you're selling the suits into the retail store. Maybe all their employees hate, hate working for this buyer, this boss. They hate him. They hate her, whatever, because she's too demanding. He's too demanding. And so you just have to kind of think about that. And it also, you know, corporate culture. You know, so when, you know, you're trying to talk to the salespeople on the floor of that, uh, you know, to sell your suits a little bit more easily, um, they don't want to hear from you, maybe. That's what, why it's important. Inf it also influences policies and programs, of course, and the culture of the buyer and the seller. There should be some fit there. That, again, it doesn't have to match perfectly, okay? It doesn't have to match perfectly, but there should be a fit there. Again, we're thinking here, this is about long-term partnering, long-term relationship. On a very short term, if it's a one-off kind of thing, well, if the organizational culture is, is not great, it's not going to make much difference. But in a long term, absolutely. So let's kind of look at what this might um, look like here um, between partners. So this was in the book, and you can just kind of see it's it's pretty basic. The next one is a little bit more involved, right? There's the supplier and there's the buyer, right? It's the interface. You know, okay, I got all these, I got my products, I'm gonna send them over. I'm the supplier, the buyer's gotta process all that. That's traditional, right? Everybody has, you know, the, the look of the traditional. But what does it look like when there's direct communication? Well, that space right is much you know removed this is open communication right and so when it becomes this the buyer and the seller well then maybe the relationship is stronger here and so you can kind of just think about ah okay this is this is not a bad way okay this is not bad right but maybe the long term is can we get closer together and so that we could support each other in a different way right and then if you notice you know the open lines of communication are more direct um okay so we talked a little bit about different thoughts about what a salesperson is right you know, a salesperson is adaptive. A salesperson is, you know, a good communicator. And we could also, and I mentioned this like a month or so ago, and think of ourselves as like a change agent, right? We'll talk about what that means, but a change agent in terms of how you represent your company, in terms of how you serve their company. So you want to change both organizations for the better. You're a change agent, more than just a salesperson. Yes, you're selling products, yes, you're selling services, but you're figuring out ways to change the relationship, to improve the partnership. And in order to do that, you get a couple of elements to just consider, things to consider. How fast, the rate of change. If you're a change agent, do you want to have a new broom sweep clean of everything right away? Or do you take time? It takes time to make changes, but got to think about, you know, change agent, if they're bringing in your suits into their stores and the hats and the gloves, you know, are coming later on, you know, do you want to help them maybe manage their inventory better? That's a change agent, not just selling, but it's like, wow, can I help improve your efficiency as a business? 
and because then it becomes the scope of the change. What degree do you want to impact the organization? Your organization and theirs. In sales, if I'm a change agent and I work for my company, I'm going to get all kinds of information and find out what's going on in the marketplace. And if I feed that information back to my company, because there's things that we're not doing as an organization to support our customers, and I develop an initiative to get some of these things handled, well, then I become a change agent. So for instance, I'm in the book business again, and I notice that some of my customers are, you know, not interested in using a particular textbook. They want a, a, a very low cost textbook. So what they're doing, instead of using thick textbooks that are cost, they're printing out, they're using readings and they're printing out things. And they're, you know, and maybe that's cost a student $30 instead of $150. And so my company doesn't have any books like that to support. And so maybe I'm like, well, we need to we need to figure out a way how to handle that. Maybe we need to print some inexpensive black and white books or loose leaf versions that they can bring in that costs less money for us to produce, but we could sell them for less. And that's kind of what happens. You know, a lot of companies produce these cheaper versions, no color, uh, loose leaf versions, uh, abbreviated versions. I become a change agent. And it's just this role of looking for opportunity and seeing where you can impact the change. So there is resistance. We'll talk about that because it's interesting, right? People don't like change. It disrupts. It's a disruption to change, it causes disruption. You know, through the transition, when we change, there's major disruption. I have to have new systems. I can't produce a black and white book. We don't, we're, not, we're not set up for that or a loose leaf version or whatever. We gotta, you know, and it and it gotta kind of look at this, you know, in terms of the rate and scope of change. So we wanna do something very fast, but it's a very tiny change. There's a, there's, there's a decent amount of resistance, but it's not major. If you wanna make a change fast and it's large scale, think about this for us, if we're, you know, as human beings, if somebody tells us we have to, you know, in our job, if we're doing a job and we need to all of a sudden, you know, imagine if, if they, your boss told you this, okay, you got to get a Windsor University uh, MBA, but you got to do it in three months. You need all the classes in three months and you're thinking broad and fast. Are you kidding me? I got to take, I don't know what, 16 classes in three months, not going to happen. Major resistance to that. But if they said, you know what, we'll give you three, we'll give you, a, you three years to do it. It then becomes a very slow scope of change or slow rate of change. And it might be, you might still have moderate resistance because it's still going to cost you to, you know, your time. But now it's over three years less resistance. So we always kind of think of this matrix if we're making change, even anything in our lives. How fast do we need to change? What is the, 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 the scope? How much, how involved is it? And we kind of blend that in and we kind of think about, okay, yeah, I can do that or oh, it's going to be major. It's going to take me major to do it. So again, as you think about yourself as a change agent, again, salesperson or your change agent at your company, kind of start thinking about that. Um, you should consider a couple things to help overcome this resistance. This is, is a good thing, find champions, meaning who's going to fight for you in your company about the work you're doing? Who's gonna fight for you to support the changes you're making? Do you have people that can help you um, promote the changes? You know, your company is introducing, uh, you know, big, big swift changes very quickly. They try to have, you know, employees that help promote them. If they do a good job, if it's a fast change, they already have, 
worked with certain of their employees that have made these changes or that understand the changes that can help sell those changes. So you got to position what you're doing, position the proposal, right? Positioning, we talk a lot about that. What does that mean? It means like, how do you frame it, right? The mindset, what is it to, how do you want to get people to think about the change, okay? So, and then you got to think about if this is a big change, what are the resources? In order to get the buyer's commitment here, if I'm going to act as a change agent, what resources do I need from my company to get that to handle? Maybe I'm going to need the marketing department of my company to provide me all kinds of literature and pictures and graphics that we can put into the store, shelf talkers and space and you know, maybe a, 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 a video that plays out, talks about that, or, you know, models or, or whatever we need that show the suits, you know, got to know what resources. And then it's got to be, you know, we got to have a, a strategy based on time, you know, basic things, you know, you think about, okay, we, we have six months to implement these changes. What do we need to do in the first month? What do I need to do in the third month? By the fourth month, we should have all these things handled. So it's smoother, right? When we're a project, when we're doing a project, if we're in project management, you lay it out. Okay, what are the things that this company, we got five projects that need to get done in the next 36 weeks, the next 36 months, whatever it is. Okay, you got to prioritize. You got to figure out, okay, which of the five are most important? How can we get them all done in the next 36 months? Same thing here, right? It's the same thing. We're just talking about it from a salesperson perspective. The disillusion, again, you know, I don't mean to, you know, say, it, it's just good to think about this. Even friendships think about this. Friend, you have long-term friends and all of a sudden, it's like, you don't hear from them anymore. What, what's about that, right? It can occur. It happens, same in business, same in business. Um, and so just kind of think about the cause, what are they caused by? Um, you look at that and you say, yeah, time to work, listening mode, okay. Um, I got gotcha. you. Um, just kind of think about this here, you know, caused by, you might not have a lot of relationships in that company. So maybe you need more. Or you just didn't monitor what's happening with the competitors. Maybe the competitors coming in, you know, they got all these really nifty uh, new materials for suits. Or maybe people aren't buying wool suits anymore. Maybe it's all synthetics because they want to are high performing. People sweat in their suits and, and you know, maybe they need uh, athletic, be flexible, I don't know. Um, sometimes you get complacent, right? And again, bankruptcy, clients close their business. So there's lots of ways that these things can break down just to kind of consider, okay, if that's the case, then how can we monitor if we're falling into complacency? How can we monitor what the competitors are doing? How can we monitor that we have enough relationships? How can we monitor and make sure the company we're dealing with is solvent? They're having problems and we need to know that ahead of time. Maybe they can't pay their bills anymore, right? It's real, real stuff. Um, so we'll, we'll look at each of these, like how to handle this one. You know, if we have few personal relationships in the company, you can kind of think about, this is not gonna happen. If you're an effective salesperson, you got multiple relationships within the account. Your buyer, you probably the, the person, the gatekeeper that gets you in the door, maybe their buyer's boss, maybe all the employees, you know, the delivery people. Um, you walk into a manufacturer, you know, you, you, you know some of the people on the on the floor, um, you know, the HR people. You got to develop multiple relationships. You know, if you work at a company and even if you're remote and the only person you know is your boss, 
and it's a larger company, that may not be a great thing. You might be best to try to connect with other people in your company, different divisions, different departments. Um, then there's probably ways to figure out how to do that. And this is kind of interesting. Think about this three by three strategy. Um, uh, having three relationships at three different levels of the organization. So this becomes then, you know, your boss, your boss's boss, and maybe a, a colleague that's at the same level or below you, three levels, different departments. So what then this reduces is the chance of getting surprised that there that maybe if you know three layers of business with your your supplier, your your buyer, maybe their communication in their company is not such that it's so open, but you're involved in multiple layers that maybe the buyer doesn't know, but because you're talking to people in the warehouse as well, they know, they've heard rumors, they're letting you know, well, you know what, you know, we haven't been paying our bills as well. You're not gonna get surprised. Or you know what, we, we've been unloading all these suits from this other manufacturer, all of a sudden, they're bringing in suits from this, this other one too. Oh, really? Ooh. Buyer's not telling you that, but now you found that out. More information that you can deal with. Maybe there's a complaint that hasn't been aired that needs to be heard. Maybe there's an objection that hasn't been dealt with that needs to be handled, okay? So as we fail, this is kind of a thing. We need to think about this. This is communication line. We fail to monitor the competitor's actions. That's important, that's communication. We need to know what the competitors are doing, right? I need to know, you know, if, since I'm in the coaching business and, and mental skills, what are, what are other people's, what are their content? What are they promoting? Maybe they're doing things differently that's taking business away from me. I don't know, but if I'm gonna be successful, I need to find that out. So, I ask my customers, I ask other people, what have you heard? What are you seeing? What are you noticing? Keep in check, right? So here's the thing, right? This is like you becoming a detective. It's the salesperson, it's the sales agent, it's also the salesperson as a de detective. How do you find this stuff out? Easy things, some basic things, some things you might not think about. You look at the logbook. I mean, we're, we're curious people. Human beings are curious by nature. You ever go into a place where you have to sign in somewhere? I mean, sometimes I know for like government buildings or something, you got to sign in, you know, or security places. Do you ever look at the list of who else is signed in? You know, maybe you're visiting. This is even, even just, you know, as an aside, you're visiting a monument in a different country and people sign in where the country is. You were curious, we wanna know where people are from. Oh yeah, there's somebody else from, from Ohio or the United States in there or whatever, you know, it's like, hmm, okay. So we check in with the front desk, we know who's been there. Oh, why is the competitor in there? Hmm, interesting. Um, keep up with their actions, the competitors, right? It's, and, and think about this too, if you're an employee in your company and the communication lines aren't open, it's up to you to kind of look at things broadly. You don't want to make too many assumptions and assume they're out to get you because their communication isn't great. But maybe there's things they're not telling the employees. Hmm, three layers, right? Think about this, how you can do that in your own company. Um, so you develop with relationships with different influencers, people that are in the know, people that can help you, people that you can go to for information. And then you kind of start to think about what are the benefits the competitors offer in their products and their strategies of selling that maybe I don't have. So it then allows you more, more assessment to say, 
They're offering short sleeve suits. We don't have short sleeve suits. And I've seen companies come in and hmm, I wonder if that's going to be something that's a problem later on. Maybe I need to talk to them about it ahead of time. Or maybe we find another supplier to offer this store short sleeve suits. And so then it becomes like, again, open lines of communication. You're delving in as a detective, looking at potential roadblocks. This is like a looking, remember we talk about objections, dealing with objections or the need behind the need. In order to do that, you have to ask a question. So maybe you just need to ask better questions. Think about that. Leonardo da Vinci said, great minds ask great questions. Are we asking great questions or not? We need to think about that. What are the great questions we need to ask? We continue to, if we, if we fail to monitor the industry, think about this. What's going on in your industry that may impact the business? Right, so salespeople, we assume, again, we assume that the responsibility for mining industry is usually with the top people. Boss, boss is boss. We can't, we can't assume that. We gotta take responsibility and, and know because we may miss opportunities that change something and we're falling behind and we fail to monitor what's going on. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's like in the United States or now in the world, right? The banking business, it's like people failed to monitor what was happening, the risk. They failed to monitor the risk in certain investments. Yes, the interest rates were going up quickly, but they failed to monitor what might happen. And they missed an opportunity, a big opportunity, because then the bank failed, right? It, it, but if an employee knew ahead of time, this is potential. Well, maybe I can move my assets out of that bank ahead of time. So it, it's real and it happens. And we need to be a good detective in figuring out what's happening in our competitors, what's happening in the industry, what's happening with our company, what's happening with the company we're dealing with. And how do we do that? We're aware. We need to be more aware. So a couple of ways to do that in the industry, read blogs and newsletters, right? Yeah, if you got key people in different places, you check in with them. Um, we go to trade shows and conferences. Certainly, you might see something on LinkedIn that might give you insight, right? We monitor those. You know, see what people are doing, see what's out there, see what people are buying. Um, all right. See you, Muhammad. Um, a plan of action. So we're gonna talk a little bit about this. How do we avoid complacency, right? Because sometimes it happens, you know, we're busy people and we can't always check in, we can't always know everything. So this is just some things to kind of consider as we're, as, as to avoid this complacency, which is just kind of a, a feeling like mm, it's not worth it, right? Um, what, sh what should we regularly do to kind of check in with our customer service, audit, notice. So think about these things. We should regularly check in and understand each individual's personal characteristics. Regularly check in, notice what's happening. We need to keep a record of promises that are made. If you're not the only salesperson calling on a company or there's other people in marketing that made some promises to your customer about offering some promotions and they didn't come through. I've had this again in, in uh, publishing when I was in the book business and selling, we're working with potential authors, right? Some of these professors were writing and we wanted to sign them to write our books, book content. So then all of a sudden they're working with a, an editor and a marketing person and myself and a legal team for my company. Now, maybe they were promised or maybe a marketing person asked them to do a review of our book. This happens, you know, somebody reviews your book, you pay them an honorarium, maybe it's a hundred dollars, maybe it's a couple hundred dollars. They didn't get their money. 
and sometimes you you know they're going to you to find out but sometimes they you they're upset with your company you don't know you go in there and they're very short with you ah if you didn't have an open line of communication you might not find out what's going on well you you mar head of marketing you know i did this review it took me 12 hours they were supposed to give me 400 dollars they didn't hmm. all right let me follow up with that follow up Customer requests. Um, make sure the paperwork is done in time. You know, sometimes it's more or less. How do you evaluate? You know, did you put your stuff in the CRM system so that the marketing people can see that you closed the sale and they can have an idea of what's needed now to 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 work with the customer? So, did you do your paperwork? Did you get it done? Did you update the spreadsheet to say it's now closed business and how much business and what they're ordering so we can make sure we have enough inventory for them? Sometimes it's as little as that, right? Um, and as we always sometimes it's constantly trying something new in order to be ahead of the game. You know, it's being creative. It's, it's figuring out new ways to satisfy the customers in that haven't been satisfied in that don't have the products yet that don't have the services yet creativity ask, ask them what they might want in the next year or two where is your company going what might you need be ahead of the game be ahead of the game that's what it comes down to in my business you know and i think chat gtp has been out for like four or five months now you know to the public i have not used it yet but I was thinking, I was reading, and just the last week and stuff, somebody, because I write a lot of articles and things, and people now are like, you know, you can write articles with ChatGTP and, and these online things. And, you know, they might not be as personal as what I have, but maybe you can, you know, use part of that. But here's the thing you can use it to write and then you edit it. That might save you hours of work. And I publish a lot of articles and, and uh, posts. And so being in the know, I got to get ahead of the game because I'm sure my competitors are, are starting to do it. I just saw one posted about it, um, what they're doing. I'm like, I don't want to be behind, right? So just kind of think about that. Um, potential conflict, right? There might be potential conflict. We've got to kind of think about that. What might be the causes here? Different policies. Different parts of the organization have conflicting goals. And so how can we avoid those, right? Steps to avoid these conflicts. Make sure they understand your products. Make sure they understand new products. Make sure we know who has authority to purchase. If there's a problem, make sure they know where to, to turn to for both the buyer and the seller. And again, think about this. We Complaints are just the beginning. They could be. If we don't get a complaint handled because the beginning of a potential major conflict, it could be. If we keep avoiding a complaint because we're complacent and we're just like, yeah, it's not a big deal. You know, yeah, we the, the suits we shipped in, we shipped one of the wrong color suits. Not a big deal. We do that a couple of times. Not a big deal in a row to us. To them, they might be thinking, oh, I got to ship this. This is a wrong one. I got to ship it back. I need a small. They sent me two extra mediums. I'm like, you know, no big deal to me, but to them, it's a big deal. I got to get that addressed ahead of time. I got to know that is a minor gripe that might become a major complaint to avoid the conflict. Okay. And then you think about it, you know, there's steps to repair damage. If, if things happen, if there's complaints and trust is decayed a little bit, I've had this with partners and partnerships. One I thought was like, all of a sudden I was doing a lot of business and then all of a sudden it's like nothing for, I can barely get them on the phone and for six months, they give me nothing. I thought everything was great. We communicated and, and then all of a sudden, I don't know what happened. You know, a little bit of trust and stuff potentially because it was some competitors going out there. So I got to be more knowledgeable and observe. I got to, you know, take more responsibility for what's going on. If they're having a tough time, 
I got to take responsibility and say, what can I do to help them? You know, in that space, gain support, gain their support, gain my company's support, put, you know, things in larger context. Maybe they got issues going on I do not know about that, okay. And they do. They, they had some employees leave, their head of marketing left. That became a problem because then they comp couldn't promote my coaching services as much. So, what does that mean? I had to do more work on my end to give them that. Um, shift the focus. It's not about blaming. It's about problem solving. I have uh, people, a few people that I know, they're always like, why are you blaming me? If they come to you with that, if an employee comes, why are you blaming me? Why are you always blaming me? Well, it might be the language we're talking to them is, is, is not appropriate. There's something going on there. Because obviously, if there's blame, we're, we're blaming them. There's something to forgive. Maybe it's not about blame. Maybe it's just this is an issue that came up. Let's get it resolved. Let's figure out how to get it resolved. You're not pinpointing blame on anybody. You're taking responsibility. Implementing the solution, and you're just like the last thing, let, let go and move on. Sometimes, sometimes it's, it is a destroying conflict, and you just... You just got to let go and move on, right? There are partnerships, there are customers. It's just like, they just, you just got to move on. You got to know, but you've done all your work. You've been able to try to figure out open lines of communication. Sometimes that's not enough. You just got to know that. All right, so that's it for this chapter. Um, in terms of partnerships, long-term relationships, um, and like I said, I want you to kind of think about this chapter, this page two, um, the stages that we have as a review. And you think about how in your own life, this is what was pretty important. You're just starting a new job, the awareness phase, then you're exploring. This is how you build value in your company, right? Let's not worry about the dissolution stage. We want to figure out, okay, we're becoming more aware. We're exploring expectations. We're following up. We're doing a good job. How can we get our role in our company expanded? What does that mean? What does that look like? Right? If we get that expanded, then we do we want to be a change agent, right? We look at that. And then we get their commitment. Yeah, you're doing a great job. I see that. That's fantastic. Can we just have, you know, the open communication piece that we talked about, how important that is um, in the relationship? And so then it becomes this, you know, overall thing about, you know, how many of these relationships can we build? How many partnering relationships can we build? We'll talk about that and how to do that in the next class, but just kind of start to think about in your own life and your own company, you know, those five foundations, open communication, the trust, the goals, the common goals, the sharing, the commitment, and where might that not be solid enough when you're seeing some conflict and how can you resolve that? So that's all I have for you today. Um, I think uh, we're gonna meet again, obviously, not I think, we're gonna meet next Tuesday, uh, no class on Saturday, um, just so you know. Get those assignments in for those that of you have not completed it yet. Um, I will extend the deadline just a few days so you'll have through the end of this weekend. So know that, okay. Um, there will be one more quiz. I will post it probably in the next week and then we'll be done with the, the chapter quizzes. So make sure if you haven't done the chapter quizzes, you get up to speed. I know there have been a few people that have asked for extensions because um, they were traveling, because they were sick or whatever. So I've, I've given a few of those, um, but try to get those done, right? They're not terribly long, 10, 12, 15 questions. Most of the last ones are 10 questions. This last one will be eight to 10 questions. Um, all right. And like I said, I will also have the uh, final exam 
I probably will open that up two weeks before the class is over to give you plenty of time to get that done. Okay, that's all I have. Have a great rest of the week, everybody, whether it's morning, afternoon, or evening. Enjoy the rest of whatever day you have left. Um, and I'll see everyone here back next Tuesday, 10 a.m. Eastern. Okay, bye, everyone. Thank you, Professor. You're Thank very welcome. Thank you, Professor. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. You. You're welcome. Bye.